The issue of climate change uh, appears regularly on the nightly news, in newspapers and magazines. It veritably assaults our senses nearly every day. But what can we do? It's a global problem, after all, beyond the reach of any one of us to really make a difference, beyond driving a little less, or recycling, will that help, or hoping that politicians finally act. This brief video is meant to help you think more actively and realistically about the changes that are going on around us, and it's also meant to empower you with some strategies of your own. Things are not hopeless. The earth and plants are resilient, and will be more so with our help. To borrow a well-worn phrase, together we can. I'm a scientist who has been studying the effects of so-called climate change on plants since 1993. You can do the math. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. First, it's important to realize that climate change isn't just about climate. Rising concentrations of the important greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, chlorofluorocarbons, and nitrous oxide, are causing a cascade of changes in our earthly system. Rising temperatures on land and in the sea, rising sea levels and changing marine currents, variable extremes in weather events, and altered nutrient cycling between plants and the soils that they inhabit. Now, that's not meant to be still more daunting. It means that if we attack the root causes of climate change, we'll be solving multiple problems simultaneously. Now, just a reminder of how those pesky greenhouse gases... Now, did you notice that I mentioned more than just carbon dioxide? are impacting the Earth. The sun warms our planet, which is a good thing. As the Earth's surface heats up, it emits infrared radiation, much of which passes back harmlessly through our atmosphere into space. That's why the Earth isn't continually heating up to a temperature that would fry life. But as we increasingly send up chemicals that accumulate over time in the atmosphere, we are creating a heat-trapping cloak. Those chemicals, CO2, methane, and others, reflect the radiation, or heat, back down to the Earth's surface instead of releasing it into space. So our Earth's surface is slowly heating up. Around the Northeast U.S., our average annual temperature has risen about 2 degrees Fahrenheit in only about 50 years. Now, that may not seem like much, but it has translated to the fact that we have about two more weeks frost-free days than we did back then. That has big ramifications for plants, as we'll see a little later on. And looking at this map, we see that the past six months in the anomalously warm winter of 2015 and 2016 have broken records. El Nino has also been particularly strong during this time, so it's not easy to draw a link between greater climate change events and the severity of these major global weather oscillations. So all scientists interpret climate data with caution. Nevertheless, the long-term trends are telling. Another trend we notice is an acceleration of sea level rise, particularly in the Northeast. This is in part due to the expansion of ocean waters, which swell as they increase in temperature. It's also due in part to the delivery of large amounts of fresh water into the sea as the polar ice caps melt. I also mentioned earlier that nutrient cycling between plants and soils will be altered by these dynamics. Warmer temperatures in particular have a big effect on the metabolisms of tiny creatures such as soil microbes and the bacteria and fungi that form natural associations, or symbioses, with plants. That means that soils can process nutrients faster or release still more greenhouse gases such as CO2 and methane via respiration into the atmosphere, as these are natural byproducts of microbial metabolism. 
So how will plants respond to all this change? Well, we can answer the question in three ways. First, by looking back at the deep past. Second, by understanding how plants are reacting now. And third, by modeling how their behaviors will change in the future. First, let's recall that 14,000 years ago, and further back, the Northeast was inundated by glaciers. Once the glaciers receded and climate warmed, certain plants quickly took over the new blank slate of land that was revealed. Plants are opportunists, after all. We can trace the advance of plants by looking at pollen cores. To do this, Palynologists, or the scientists who study pollen, sink a hollow metal core deep into the sediments of ponds or peatlands where pollen is particularly well preserved. Each layer in a pollen core can be aged independently using chemical techniques. Thus, a pollen core gives us a glimpse into the past going back thousands of years. From the pollen diagram on the right, we can see that 14,000 years ago, on the bottom, spruce, a cold-tolerant tree, was especially common in terms of the percentage of pollen in the core in that layer once the glaciers had loosened their grip on the land. Ash, elm, and oak began to take over about 12,000 years ago, and oak still holds sway on our landscape today. Grasses, ragweed, and other herbs gained a foothold about 8,000 years ago, during a pronounced warming period. We can also look back into a more recent period using the valuable historical records that are stored in the many herbaria, or plant collections, of the Northeast. These display specimens of plants along with information on the dates and places of the collection. When these plants are flowering, we can discern when the potential first flowering occurred in the year when the plants were collected. And botanists love to collect flowering plants. Note the fully open flower and leaves on this horse chestnut tree, Aeschylus hippocastinum. Because good temperature records have also been collected over the past century or more, we know how warm it was on the day that that specimen was collected and for the many more specimens that have been collected since. In early spring months that show a three degree above normal average, some of our familiar plants have a tendency to flower earlier in response. For example, if you look at Baptisia tinctoria, yellow wild indigo, a plant of sand plains, uh, toward the right here, it flowers as many as 50 days earlier during the warmer years, from 200 days to 150 days post the beginning of the year. Invasive species also tend to be highly responsive to warmer spring temperatures, leafing out much earlier than native species in warmer years. I photographed this invasive honeysuckle leafing out in April a few years ago. Now, perhaps that's a way to actually detect it and manage it. But shrubs that leaf out earlier could also have the ability to shade out some of our showiest spring ephemeral plants, such as this painted trillium, Trillium undulatum, which try to take advantage of early emergence to get their reproductive business done before they are shaded out by trees and shrubs. So we've looked back into the deep and slightly more recent past to understand how plants have responded to temperature and other changes. Now we take a moment to look at how plants would be expected to respond now, based on their basic physiology, and how we can predict, or not, how they may behave in the future. First, we know that plants are great at taking up carbon dioxide and giving off oxygen. They take in water and nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, to make their metabolism run. Those nutrients are the building blocks of the enzymes that drive photosynthesis, that build their tissues, and that construct their DNA, the genes that they're going to deliver into the next generation. Plants will respond in the short term by adapting on the fly, 
Much as we do when we sweat in too much heat or shiver in too much cold or drink more water when we're parched. These are so-called plastic or flexible responses made in the short term, even in the course of seconds or minutes. Plants will also change in the long term via the mechanism of natural selection. They'll evolve to be able to survive in warmer climes, under deeper water, or in response to a deficit of rain. Other species will expand their ranges. They'll move, as those did following the retreat of the glaciers. Cold adapted species may move northward or upward in elevation. Others, chased by rising sea levels, may try to move inland. But all of these responses are complicated by other limits. A fast-growing plant taking in a glut of carbon dioxide may in the end run up against a dearth of nutrients that will fuel its growth. In fact, research suggests that herbivores, such as hungry caterpillars or newly arriving insects from the south, may consume more leaves because they hunt more voraciously for nitrogen that is sparse in the leaves by comparison to all the carbon that these leaves have now consumed. Pathogenic fungi and bacteria, such as those that cause sudden oak death, may be able to move north into climates that can support them. And if plants are in small populations that lack the genetic diversity to enable them to evolve, those populations could be vulnerable to disappearing. If rising sea levels compromises plants, our coastal habitats could be inundated unless we act now to fortify them. But as we heard about last week, scientists like Laura Meyerson are developing ways to restore salt marshes. But plants may ultimately be limited in their ability to migrate upslope if they bump into pavement or already developed lands, a phenomenon that I call the I-95 effect. So is it all hopeless? No. Many, many people and organizations, including New England Wildflower Society and its many partners, are working tirelessly to come up with solutions to both the causes and the consequences of climate change. Perhaps the most famous initiative worldwide is the Global Seed Vault, hidden deep in the frozen ice of Svalbard in Norway, above the Arctic Circle. With natural refrigeration, the millions of seeds from tens of thousands of plant species are well protected, where they can lay dormant in a deep frozen sleep until they're needed to restore degraded habitats miles from where they live now. New England Wildflower Society has collaborated with the Millennium Seed Bank of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in London, England, to contribute seeds to this collection. Closer to home, though, New England Wildflower Society is building its own seed arc, a five-year, $5 million initiative to protect all of the nearly 700-plus rare plant species of New England. The Hope Goddard Iceland Foundation is helping us greatly in this project, and so can you by donating your funds or volunteer time. We're also participating in a long-term effort to collect the seeds of plant species that can be used to restore the coastal habitats, beaches, and salt marshes and sand plains that were devastated by Superstorm Sandy in 2012 to make these habitats more resilient for future storms and the sea level rise that we know are underway. Now, what do we mean by resilient? Those ecosystems are resilient that have solid connections through natural areas to other ones. Those that can support the pollinators and other animals that rely on and help plants across large areas 
and those lands that have proven to retain their ecological processes and integrity over time, even following major disturbances such as hurricanes, ice storms, and climatic extremes such as droughts. Many conservation organizations working together have identified and prioritized these areas across a wide swath of the Northeast. And many local land trusts, as well as national organizations, are working to conserve them. Other current strategies include supporting research to better understand the basic workings of plants, their physiology, their climatic tolerances, the other organisms with whom they interact, such as pollinators and herbivores, and the animals for whom they provide habitat. It's essential to support new students of plants, too, to attract new talent to the fields of botany and ecology. This is the new generation of people who will see plants and all their associated organisms into the future. You, too, can provide important research data. Participate in citizen science efforts. Project Bud Burst is a great way to get involved. They systematically track the earliest leaf out and bud burst and flowering of a whole range of plants across the country and are generating really valuable data. And of course, we'd always love you to become a plant conservation volunteer at New England Wildflower Society. And you can always send your plant observations to Plant Share. Or, if your inclinations stretch beyond plants to birds, think about contributing your bird feeder data to eBird, a national initiative of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. At the national level, we all need to advocate strongly for policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. More of your representatives need to hear from you, loudly, about how important this is. A recent, very well-respected, peer-reviewed report by the Northeast Climate Impacts Assessment concluded that if we do not undertake these efforts as individuals, as communities, and at the national level, it is highly probable that greenhouse gas emissions will continue to increase. And if that happens, New Hampshire will have the climate of North Carolina by 2070, within our lifetimes, or those of our children and grandchildren. Enough said.